In the beginning of this, uh, good morning all first, into this session. In the beginning of this session, I'll introduce our uh, guest speaker. And after that, you will have the opportunity to uh, hear her presentation and ask questions. Okay, I hope you can see this short slides that I have prepared. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome to this uh, morning session. The topic that we are all here to hear from our guest is the role of innovation in future projects and startups. As usual with this PD session, we have around an hour and a half for this session and uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the session and after the end of the session please allow me two to three days to take your attendance after which the exit quiz for this session will be available for you and uh, now it's my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker alanut al hashmi uh, first, also, I would like to thank our partners from Young Arab Leaders who created this contact and made this possible. Alanut is a Young Arab Leaders member. On top of that, she is an Emirati thought leader and serial entrepreneur with a digital technology transformation futuristic focus. Over the last 15 years, she held an array of strategic leadership positions that drastically contributed to Dubai's and the UAE media, business and creative production scene. She built her executive leadership portfolio and experience through various roles in institutions affiliated with business, entrepreneurship and media scene in the UAE. She is currently the CEO of the Futurist Company. This is an SME she founded in 2020 to contribute to the USE's advancements as a hub of latest technologies and disrupt its applications in human life, developing and managing future-facing projects, including agri-tech, renewable energy, and battery solutions. She is also the founder and CEO of Gaia. She launched Gaia in 2021. It is an agri-tech solution, farming fruits and vegetables that is kind to the environment. Alanut, thank you for being with us. And over to you now. This is a lot of pressure for, for me, honestly speaking. Good morning, everyone. I'm a person who studied in the higher colleges of technology, so this is too much pressure for me, <laughs> speaking to people that uh, inspired me and um, played a role in my journey, um, becoming an adult. That's the best way to put it, uh, learning uh, deadlines and, uh, and a lot of pressure and stress, but and dealing with it, most probably, is the best way to say it. So my name is Renaud Al Hashmi. I'm going to be speaking to you. And I hope I will be able to add insights, I think most, most importantly, and information on what is the entrepreneurial journey and how innovation actually played a huge role in evolving the business and getting us where we are today. And, um, and the Futures Company is not the only business I started. I had uh, two attempts before that where I failed and then the Futures Company came to life. So I'm gonna be sharing a brief, um, journey with you guys, play a video, show you a couple of slides on how innovation helped us with one of our solutions. I don't want it to be boring or dry. I want it to be very spontaneous and, and, and you know, exchanging information and data because in the end of the day, I'm, I'm sharing this with you, uh, not for you to, to, to be learning from me as much as learning from the journey and see how it can add value to you personally and the, to the students and, and, and you know, your ecosystem. Um, so I'll start with, um, I think very important is the authenticity, knowing who you are. So I'm an Emirati. Um, I'm, I was born in 1988. I studied in private schools. I actually did three years in government schools. I have always had a good English due to, I think, practical um, experience of using English with friends and um, family members. Um, other than that, I studied in a, in a school with American system. And let me tell you, it did not have any influence on my English. It was totally mostly private 
experience and and and, and growth and evolving of the, the language skills. I speak four different languages, and I've studied uh, first of all mass communication in HCT. I actually did not finish that. I went and I moved on to study biotechnology. Um, I focused on and botany and biology. That was a very interesting thing. I know it sounds very geeky, but it's so much fun. <laughs> I love it. Um, from there, I, I had to work in a very young age to support my family. Uh, my mom was a single mom. I had two younger sisters and I worked and I was supporting my mother and my sisters. Um, being an entrepreneur can be one of the best blessings for someone who's trying to build themselves. Not only themselves, their family with them. The, 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 the challenges that they face normally is the understanding of the ecosystem, understanding of the politics, understanding of the demands, the supply chain, how to uh, fulfill uh, a client or, or a consumer need, uh, the difference between needs and wants, understanding what the business, the core basic of the business and business have evolved uh, drama dramatically in the last 25 years, I would say. Um, starting from there, I worked in different roles and um, I had I had like a focus that I need to learn everything about business. So I started with a bank, finished from the bank, worked in the government, actually building ecosystems. So I worked in two different, uh, four different free zones. One of them was Dubai Silicon Oasis and I was promoting the ecosystem. So I was establishing product development, creating this ecosystem and then promoting it. So you understand the infrastructure and the foundation of an ecosystem. Then I moved, um, I started my first business and it was actually, it was profitable. It, was, it wasn't a failure from a financial point of view. It was a failure of I'm not passionate enough about it. That wants me to keep going. I don't know if that make any sense when, when you do something, but you're not really, it's not your thing. It's not your niche. It's not your, what you really want to achieve. That's where it kind of um, did not work. Um, I got married. I moved to UK. I was a consultant in UK for different businesses on uh, project management, marketing strategy, etc. cetera. Uh, from there, came back to Dubai, worked in Dubai Holding, Ticom Group, uh, managing the marketing strategy and events for Dubai Media City, Dubai Studio City, Dubai Production City. Before that, I did work in the media sector as a director and a filmmaker. And it was always something I'm passionate about, understanding the power of media and how, how it can influence change perceptions, etc. cetera. Um, from there, I, said, I did my a global MBA, uh, University of Manchester, and I did my digital transformation with MIT. That's when I had better financial kind of stability my sisters were working i was able to spread my wings and get all the knowledge that i can grab and, and you know grasp for my journey um from there what what the futurist company was born it was a result of three different aspects i think it's important to understand the younger generation and how um the younger generation how we may be looking to businesses a business is no longer um, an option for just an, a monthly income that you are your own boss. It's, it's much more than that. It became something that fulfills um, an ambition, uh, fulfills an idea, uh, something you believe in strongly that you really want to achieve through a business. Uh, I know so many out of 10, I can, well, I can, you know, you kind of keep your friends, surrounding friends, very similar to you, but out of my 10 friends around me, eight of them are entrepreneurs, if, if not nine. And they all went through a very similar journey, which I'm going to share with you. And I think it's very interesting because it shows you a pattern. If I can identify eight, nine people out of 10 that went through a similar journey that I did and decided to drop their normal job. I'm not giving you guys any ideas for you to drop what you're doing. We need you. But I'm just talking about the entrepreneurial journey and how um, they, ne they needed to drop their government or semi-government or private job and focus on their entrepreneurial journey. Uh, the first thing was um, th the people I'm talking about, they are faster in processing data and information, finding, finding solution. They always felt that they're being, being pulled back by people around them because they take more time and require more time to identify solutions, challenges, and work on them. So they use always to be frustrated by the slow progress of what's happening around them. So they're frustrated. They do not like what, what's happening. Number two, uh, they had uh, strong ideas. They had powerful ideas, very uh, influential, 
but what's happening in the workplace that there's no one to believe in their ideas. And, and you know, when, when you're really a passionate person with that forward uh, mindset and uh, mentality, you will try once, you'll knock on every door and you'll try twice. And then by the third time, if it doesn't work, you'll just leave. Uh, third, they saw the mistakes in the corporate world. They want to fix it in their own businesses. So they know what doesn't work or they know the opportunities available somewhere else and they want to grab it and take it and make it happen. Fourth, and I think this is very crucial, these people are very highly sensitive, but they give you a feeling that they're very strong. That is the patterns I felt I found in the entrepreneurs that I'm dealing with on a regular basis, and whether it's from my network, friends, or people I'm working with. Now, why I'm saying that? Because it actually played a part in my, in my own journey. Um, when I worked, I felt like you can do and exceed expectations in the corporate world, but there is no recognition. You can do it for three, four, five, six, seven years, and there is no, nothing will change. They're expecting you to be happy with your monthly salary without any recognition. They were wrong. I actually left. And until today, they tried to ask me to come back, but that, that's it. You know, when you, when you start and you, and you have that taste, the first taste of building your own thing, you no longer want to continue in a corporate world. Now, there is another aspect, which is very important in my own and personal journey. I worked in the corporate world in government, semi-government and private sector, and I understand how much money is being generated uh, from a profit point of view. And when you look into anything good that has been done, whether it's CSR or, or sustainability, it's not that much. It's not even close to a small percentage of the profit that's being um, produced and developed and earned. And that kind of uh, gave me a bit of um, a nudge to look further into it. So I always was supporting in every company I was in, the marketing and the CSR team is like my friends. If there's anything I can contribute and support with, I will always be there uh, whether it's volunteering, supporting, helping, etc., I was always annoyed as well by the fact of um, if you don't have the funding, you don't have the budget, your project or CSR initiative, this good thing you're trying to do is not going to happen. So it's very independent on, um, dependent on the fact that you need certain budget and certain amount. All of these things kind of created this uh, curiosity on say. Maybe this is a bit personal, but I always used to pray that, you know, God, I'm here for, for life. Maybe it sounds very sentimental and very hippie, but this is very true. I used to pray that, God, I'm here on a journey in this life and make it with a purpose and allow me to help others in that journey. So I always believed that I'm here to support and help others. And when I worked on so many CSR initiatives and understood that companies NGOs, all of them depend on a source of uh, budget, source of income to be able to achieve anything. And I, as I was doing my global MBA, uh, and you know, in the University of Manchester, there's this critical thinking, and that critical thinking started kicking in. And uh, I, I literally felt, um, how can I change this gap, this problem that I see into a business opportunity? How this can be a business model where I can help people and do something good, but it's profitable and independent. So it actually can generate its own um, source of income, its own profit. So it's sustainable. It sustains itself. It keep going and keep giving. And that's where the Futures Company started. I was very blessed to have met with a bunch of scientists when I was in the UK from six different nationalities, uh, PhD as scientists, researchers, and engineers. And I spent a great time. I was volunteering with them working on a project in Swansea. And one of the outcomes was that the way I think is something that they always have it in the back of their heads and that they would like to work together. And that's the first people I went and I sat with and I said, okay, guys, I'm going to start this. I have an idea. Let me know what you think. And it was literally as simple as um, let's create a business model that does something really good. Um, whoever is going to partner going to make money. It's like, you know, when you say in the negotiation, you're trying to make the pie as big as possible for everyone. So everyone get a bigger slice. And that's how everyone wins in this situation. We're creating it as a business model where ROI is high, where it has a good impact. Uh, environmental social governance, ESG is, is, is considered in every aspect. Carbon footprint is considered in every aspect. And we're focusing on what really matters 
And uh, what really matters now is the energy, water, food nexus. And that's what we're focusing on at the Futures Company. And I will come to what the Futures Company does. So it sounds very cool, but definitely we don't have a time machine. Uh, it's actually the opposite. We'll, we'll go into the time machine because of the data and the research and the reports that we have. And we look at the patterns. So we do a lot of data analysis. Um, and when we analyze the data, we found out that most of the problems that we have today, we could have avoided 25 years ago if we had a solution for them 25 years ago. So if we had a solution to, um, let's say, desalination and the amount of energy desalination consumes, which makes it very not environmental, unless you have renewable energy. If 25 years ago we found a solution, today desalination would have been easier, which means water would have, um, we'll have more access to water. We'll be able even to reduce some of the water levels around the world by providing clean water for places that needs it, which will help in agriculture. So many aspects, it's very interconnected. And that sparked the idea of finding solutions for problems that's gonna happen in the future. And it's not imagination, it is facts. We know exactly what's gonna happen. And we know all the factors and the different role players in making that impact. And in some of them, they're very catastrophic. Uh, they're from like Hollywood movies. It's really that scary um, because it affects your thought of what the future of yourself, your children and, their, and your grandchildren, their children, when it comes to having clean water, clean air and food and energy. So it all started with that uh, mindset and we sat and we brainstormed and we worked into what is the most important thing now. And the report showed a, a very, very clear pattern on food security and the importance of food security. And in the meantime, everyone is very excited about it and uh, like the idea of robots, giving you food and, and nice, cool hydroponics and pipes. Actually, food security is what much, much, much more important for every one degree Celsius, the temperature increase, increase worldwide, we're gonna lose 10% of arable land. That means by 2050, 50% of this planet will be providing food for the other 50%. Imagine the geopolitical situation that will be played around. Just imagine how things can be. The next immigration is going to be climate immigration. It's gonna be food immigration, water immigration, air immigration. So we do have a lot of challenges and I do believe you guys are influencing a lot of students who can be inspired on the opportunities available in that sphere where they can actually contribute. And being in the UAE, we're very blessed. We have a government that not only have a 2050 strategy for carbon neutral, they have a hundred years started 2171 for in, in investing and developing the space the sector here. And there's a beautiful uh, story why that is. And um, Vaseline, because of young Arab leaders, I had the privilege to sit with uh, Imran Sharaf and ask him all my curious questions, which are very, very a long list uh, of different diverse um, questions about why is the Sheikh is doing this? Why you guys had to do it? Who, how did you do it? Who was part of it? And you understand that this region was built of over 50% of youth. The education is the most important aspect in every, every element whether you, can, you want them to be smarter, have a better future, be able to develop business, businesses, respect women, respect humanity, terrorism, every aspect is education is the core of it. So it's very important. So back to the futures company, uh, three, four years before we set up the company, we were working on a prototype for a food security solution. And the way that solution came, I think it's, it's, it is the subject of this talk. And, and it's good for me to tell you an example on how, how things work and innovation, how it affected a future solution than giving you figures and numbers only. And I'm gonna throw some figures and numbers because it's good to have facts. But what I meant is, instead of just, just giving you some images, I wanna to mention to you the actual uh, journey and I'll show you some of the images if you guys want as well. Just looking at the time, I don't wanna be blabbering. Um, it started with identifying food security as one of the most crucial aspects. And I mentioned some of the facts. Um, the UAE have a beautiful story around agriculture. Sheikh Zayed inspired a lot of us. Um, there's two aspects. Sheikh Zayed believed that we can have agriculture and plants, trees, while 
he had experts telling him it's impossible. Don't even think about it. You won't be able to do it. Soil doesn't work. Water you don't have. So why are you doing that? He said, we'll be able to do it. And he managed. Uh, the UAE is a desert and you drive around. And yes, I know it's human made, but you have greenery that is affecting temperature that is adding oxygen in the air. So this is very important. And that journey that he had to, to go and embark was way tougher in the 1968 and, and the early 60s when he was doing it. It inspired us and we came to the fact to look into traditional farming and agri-tech. So traditional farming, how it works, all the aspects and agriculture technology, how it works and all the aspects. So we looked into each of them, almost like a SWOT analysis, but in depth scientific one. What is affecting them? What kind of pesticides? What are the chemicals? What kind of crop? What is the temperatures? What is the impact? How is the quality? What is the mistakes that's been done by farmers, you know, because they don't have the knowledge. Keep in mind, coming from a culture that is desert, uh, you don't have generations of farmers that will say, oh, Allah, I, I know this trick because of my grandfather. My... If you have any farming, it will be in very restricted areas, very close to the mountains, certain kind of crops, or an Al-Ain, where you have uh, irrigation systems, man-made irrigation systems. So uh, we looked into both traditional and agri-tech, and we found out that the problem with agri-tech is a uh, different uh, aspect that's making it either too expensive, very not environmental, and the OPEX cost of the OPEX is very high, which is increasing everything else. The variety of options of crop is also very, very narrow and limited. And having a business model that caters for the future was not there. We went to traditional agriculture and we learned that they're gonna face a lot of challenge. They're very stubborn and they're resisting any kind of change. They don't like change. Now, and I'm a, I'm a stubborn person. If I'm dealing with myself, I will, if, if that person, I'm not convinced, I will say, well, I told you what, you what I think. It's up to you. I'm not going to waste time. So dealing with farmers was as difficult as that. Convincing them you need solar panels was, was not a very welcomed idea. Let me put it that way. Cutting their cost is like, no, I need my labels. They, they, they entertain me. Um, let's let's uh, do something that is very different, very innovative. No, but that's gonna, it's a higher cost. It's very good, but it's good ROI. It's good for you. It's return of investment. It's actually high. They're not interested. So traditional farmers were very clear on the fact that they, they're not open for new ideas, but that doesn't mean that we need to drop it. We need to have a solution because what they're embarking, what they're going to go through in the next 15 years maximum, so in five to 15 years, the water will not be able to support them with growing uh, fruits and vegetables. The price of fruits and vegetables is going to go so high, they won't be able to get the seeds. The seeds are going to be too expensive. Fertilizers and chemicals would be banned by international organizations. We won't be able to use them. That means their crop and harvest will be affected by so many other factors. So it's not a winning situation at all. And um, educating them need to take uh, slow steps one by one by showing them different examples and getting them slowly to be integrating with agritech solutions. So we consider these things because when we work, we're working on future facing solutions. We're not working on just a business model because I can totally ignore the farmers and go and work only on my solution. I will be making money but I will come and face the farmers later on in the future. So we're trying to avoid that by, by integrating the ecosystem from initiating steps, uh, inviting them to see and learn, showing them our prototypes, telling them, let's test your carrots and our carrots. Let's test your tomatoes and our tomatoes. Let's see how, what is the difference? Would you like us to show you how you can actually save water? Would you like us to show you something without pushing? That kind of had better results. Now, when we have developed a solution, innovation actually played a huge role if it's not actually the core of this solution. First of all, data, data, data is so important for innovation. You need to understand how this works, why it works that way, um, 
why these factors affect this project or this business model. And from there, we looked into the data for the last 25 years, sometimes beyond up to 60. And in the future, the projection, so you can actually see the trajectory of temperature, the different factors, and you can see the results, what might happen and how things might change. All of that got us to the part where we realized that, okay, this is very important, but we need more data. We found some information available in NASA, NASA Space and the Russian Space Center. So NASA and the Russian Space Center, they had some reports on agriculture and how they conducted it in space. We, we looked into it, we looked into how they're doing it in space and we found some interesting stuff that we actually really liked. And we said, okay, let's plug this in, let's do some prototypes and let's test it. So we did a prototype and the prototype um, was tested beyond, below zero, minus two, and above 45, up to 50 degrees. Now, the beauty of it, we've done so many of them. So, you know, with prototypes, it's, it's, it's testing, 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 until you figure it out. And uh, after uh, 76 different tests, physical different tests, we actually did 114, some of them in the lab, in the lab we reached to a prototype that gave us the same results in below zero and above 45. We know here we correct climate change. We know that we got something really important here. And that's where we know we are developing something that is very crucial and very important. And the hard work started literally to take it from prototype to an actual commercial 40 foot capsule was not easy. It was in one of these coolers, you know, this uh, coolers, you put your drinks and ice and take it to the desert or the beach. We took one of these and we did a prototype inside to create the, the capsule environment, this climate controlled environment. And when we had to take it to the commercial uh, size, which is 40 foot, uh, it was not easy. And it was during COVID. Containers were so expensive to ship anything. Logistics were all over the place. Um, to ship anything, containers went from $2,000 to $8,000. It was a disaster for us. We faced a lot of problems and we had to deal with them. We had delays in some of our progress. We had to be very patient. I'm not a very patient person, I have to admit. I like to go from zero to 100 in three seconds. And this was like the test of life that I have to be patient and smile and say, we'll figure it out in a couple of months or waiting for the container to arrive with all the technology and the different prototypes and the different uh, pieces and put it all together. So what is the solution we have developed in the futures and what does the future? So I explained to you briefly what the futures does. We work on future facing projects. We believe we can avoid a lot of problems in the future by implementing the solutions today. And to be able to do that, you need to have policymakers, you need to have the government, you need to have the ecosystem, you know, whether it's a startups or small and medium enterprises, big organizations. For example, we work with GM a lot on the electric vehicles and uh, renewable charging and renewable battery storage systems. How we create that ecosystem. And one of our projects as the Futures Company is Gaia, G A I A. Gaia is our farming solution, future farming solution. It's an AI scalable farming system. By that, I mean that it has less people that need to be there physically. The AI learns and manages the crops, live feed and data collection being collected, a controlled environment giving the plants what they need, not what we think they need, whether it's temperature, climate, humidity, even the feeding system. There's algorithms for every kind of crop giving it exactly what it needs, not what we think it needs, because that's a mistake. And when I say mistake, it's because of humanity. We have done that before with uh, animals and plants. And uh, last but not least, it is scalable. It can be put anywhere. Uh, it can be any size. And the beauty of it as an Emirati is that the, this whole solution is made in the UAE. So we're doing everything in the UAE. Innovation role and the whole developing of Gaia and the important role of Gaia on our lives is, is now... Um, because I know the 10 years plan of the company. Now you will think it's food. We still have foods in the groceries. Yes, brilliant. I'm so happy we still do have food. But for the future, um, having a solution that you can drop anywhere in the middle of the desert that can provide food for you, 
is, is very uh, needed uh, for different locations worldwide with some of the facts and the information I mentioned, having 50% of the planet providing for the other 50%. That means the next kind of conflict will be food conflict, water conflict, and air conflict. Uh, it will be a conflict on resources, not the conflict on um, borders and, and, and uh, lands. It will be a different type of conflict. So the country that have food security is a country that's gonna be very strong. Even some of the countries that I visited uh, in the last year, for work and visiting for site visits and, and meeting uh, partners. Some of the countries I visited is countries with highest water levels when it comes to rain. But even the water level is too much that their agriculture is not understanding. So they're losing a lot of crop. So food security is not only for places of heat and desert, even cold places are struggling when it comes to food security. Now food security is one aspect we're working on. We work in renewable energy. We work in, in um, battery solutions, storing renewable energy and integrating different renewable energies. We have some ARVR projects and that's kind of roughly what we're working on. We have a team uh, allocated between the UAE, US and UK. Uh, we have um, three technologists, eight engineers and five researchers. And this is our team who are always in the lab and they have a better day than us sitting in the office. They enjoy what they're doing, they love it, they're passionate, and they're very smart. Um, this is roughly what the Futures does and what Gaia, one of our solutions does. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions now before we go to any slides. I think it's good. If anyone have questions, please feel free to jump in. Wow, I was very informative. No one have questions? I have a question. Please, go, Mr. Mr. Can you hear me? Yes, what's your name, sir? Uh, Hussam Omar, Dubai Women's College. I have a question. I, we always talk about sustainability in our classes and all of that. Um, I'm wondering what, what uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can talk about this at the end of the lecture, maybe it's better, I don't know. But uh, how can the average person contribute to the preservation of uh, the environment and uh, the food and then all that sustain to sustain our lifestyle. Because in Dubai, as in other countries, the, the lifestyle is, uh, they don't really make, the government make, the government makes a lot of, uh, no, they make a note of it, that we have to preserve and, and you have to be careful. But uh, the average person doesn't understand the need for uh, it's a culture of abundance and we waste a lot of food you know we go to restaurants and uh, homes we waste a lot of resources we waste a lot of assets uh, so I, my my question to make the long story short how you make the average person you know every time they can hear if you will aware of the importance of every individual's effort that it matters everybody have to preserve uh, the intake, uh, the, the, the power they consume, the food they take, whatever. Maybe you can allude to this at the end of the lecture, but maybe better, I'm not sure, but that's no, I think I think it's good to, to, to discuss it. I think it's very important to understand that uh, sustainability is something that um, government's responsible for when it comes as a policy maker, putting regulations and putting policies because that's how you can actually create a, um, a work frame, you know, create a flow uh, where people understand the impact and the results. Not only do this, but why you're doing this and the impact of what you're doing is very important. Education plays a huge role. Once you understand your carbon footprint and how you can actually reduce it, automatically you'll have that thing in the back of your head telling you this is the, the option. So I'm gonna go for this instead of this because this is a better option for me. Now, as individuals, um, there's two ways they get impacted. It's by the place where they work, that this place is actually considering ESG and sustainability, whether in printing, you know, only printing when it's really necessary, not printing at all. Uh, even business cards can be now digital. Um, all these small details actually plays a role because they accumulate this economy of scale. So if you have one university doing it, then you have all universities doing it, it's, it's a huge impact. Turning off the lights when no one is there in the office or no one there in the class, that plays a huge role. 
because we are a company, a country that um, consumes electricity using uh, uh, like either coal or fossil fuel. So the carbon footprint is actually high. Nevertheless, in the last 15 years, we have invested a lot in renewable energy. The UAE have a good percentage actually compared to even developed countries using renewable energy uh, as one of the resources of their uh, energy that they consume, uh, our electricity. So having Baraka or even having nuclear solution or now, you know, with, with, with hydrogen coming as well into the scene. And um, that's a different thing. But the important thing, I think, the point that you mentioned, um, for example, let's say food waste. There is a company called Circa. Uh, founder is Egyptian, PhD owner, where your food turns immediately by adding some kind of insects into fertilizers. Now you see that that's food waste. I see it food waste. He see it money making. The more we have businesses that turns these things that we don't have power on changing. You go to the restaurant, you can't really tell them Give me, I'll, I take extra food. I'm the kind of a person, the fanciest restaurant, I don't care. Can I take that takeaway? Give it to me. I'll give it to the valet guy. I'll give it to a cleaner. I'll give it to someone who can actually consume it as long as it's clean, not touched and intact. Nevertheless, a restaurant responsibility is finding a solution. That's where the policy making comes. So if they go to someone like Circa, where that food, they get paid for that waste food. So trust me, your waste food, you'll never look at it as waste if it's making money for you. Because the guy who's collecting that food is gonna make even more money when he turns it into fertilizers. So that mindset, that opportunity on what can be achieved from a business point of view, turning every sustainability point, because we're still a very new, fairly new in sustainability sphere. So there is a lot of opportunities. If every opportunity can be managed and tackled from a business point of view, where there is win-win, you have something that affects the environment, I'm going to take it from you and you're going to get something out of it. Trust me, everyone is going to do it because there's money involved. It's a business, purely business. So business can actually be the solution for sustainable uh, issues. I hope I answered your question. You Please. did, you, you did. And then also as an individual, like, you know, recycling, for example, I, I'm talking about individual. So where you work affects the way that you think by uh, applying these when you go home you take it with you you take it to your kids you take it to your family so that plays a role and then at the home itself whether it's recycling reusing uh redoing any of the resources that you have and like for example um when you wash your dishes uh, that excess water can be used to clean something else because it's not that bad or not that dirty these are small things to you it doesn't make a huge difference but it's if, if you have the economy of scale, you have tens of thousands of people doing it, um, hundreds of thousands of people doing it. You start somewhere. So education plays a huge role, changing mindset and perception. Yeah. The, the government uh, can uh, do, uh, can spread the word. It definitely has, has a role, a big role, okay? Mm -hmm. But also individuals, they have uh, duty and they have a role to understand that uh, uh, small things matter, like small small actions matter. Like I mean, when you have the lights off, when you leave your... Uh, uh, your room, not to uh, you know, just consume what what you need, and not not just to over uh, overdo overdo it. And uh, I watched a documentary recently about the environment uh, on Netflix uh, about three. I think it's a three-hour series, and I, I wasn't even aware of how dangerous or how um, vital this topic is until I watched that documentary. It's, it's a it's very, very important one, right? Um, awareness and it's just the government alone. I think each one of us has a duty to spread awareness in that in that area. Mr. Hussam, was it breaking boundaries with David Attenborough? I'm sorry? Was the documentary you watched breaking boundaries, David Attenborough with the Swiss um, doctor, PhD owner? No, no, I put it in the American documentary and I got, I got uh, I get attracted to it. I was watching it on Netflix, and it turned out that uh, the main character in the in the documentary was, was one of my students in the US. And I contacted her. I said, I watched the documentary in Dubai, and she, she was very happy, you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'll send you the name of the documentary. I'm not sure about yes, the name. Yes, yeah. That's amazing. But, but it was a definitely an excellent documentary, excellent one. Brilliant. We have one more question. What are the three main type of crops? So we're focusing on five type of crops. Um, we're doing bell peppers. Uh, lettuce and leafies. We're doing tomatoes, 
and we're exploring a cucumber as well and uh, um, strawberries. But we are doing a lot of um, R and D on on how we can grow almost uh, almost not everything, but almost everything. I think we answered. If there's any other questions. Okay, I will try to share it now with you guys uh, the video. If you allow me, just give me a minute. So I'm going to try to share this video. And uh, uh, just let me give me a thumbs up if you can hear. I, I will I will do share audio, share sound. So that's just a short video I thought I would share with you. And um, I think it's very important to maybe discuss with you guys on how you think innovation. I, I don't know, um, honestly, I apologize, but I don't know who's doing what. But when, when we're talking about innovation and innovation impacting business or business model, or even like a business proposition, um, a lot of people think it's, um, it's only technology. So it's like, a, you add uh, one technology to it, and that it becomes innovative. I don't know who agrees with that, but if you do, uh, uh, please do tell me. I would love to hear your point of view on that, because that's what a lot of people told me when I started. Like uh, They think if by plugging in a technology that is um, going to substitute a human being, most probably, uh, that's when I'm being innovative. And that's how innovation is actually affecting the business. Um, what I learned um, in my journey is that um, technology was not good enough. You can put the technology, you, you might reduce uh, one person's salary and cost, but it was never the, the solution. It was a tool, it was never a solution. So what we, I realized in the end of my journey, and that's my personal point of view, it's my personal point of view totally, um, Innovation came first from being honest on the current circumstances, stakeholders, resources, your situation totally from a 360 point of view, very holistic. That honesty is the first step toward innovation because you can never be innovative when you don't have all the right information, accurate information with you. Second was, you know, they say thinking outside of the box sometimes throwing the boxes the actual way because the box is just framing you and limiting you to, in every aspect. They tell you, this is how they do it for the last 300 year agriculture, never changed for hundreds of years. Hydroponics, the biggest thing they talk about a lot in agriculture is an actually 300 years old irrigation system. It's nothing new. So it's not innovative. It's just now they do 3D printed uh, pipes and you know, it's not something new. The new thing in agri-tech is when you literally put different technologies together that will work in synergy together. And I say different three minimum technologies together and above. So in Gaia, we have 10 different technologies. 
that integration of different technologies together is what allowing us to be able to say and have a, a prototype, an actual commercial size 40 foot um, in less than five years. If I use only one technology, I would never be able to achieve it. It's impossible. It's impossible. Because to tackle climate, humidity, water, temperature, um, vitamins, nutrition, um, feeding, lighting, um, uh, uh, air purification, um, data collection, um, live feed, um, manufacturing, supply chain, um, all of that, if I just did one aspect of technology, I would not have the solution. So innovation needs a human being. Innovation cannot be created by AI. That's the beauty of innovation. It needs a human being to pull in all these different aspects and put it together and in synergy when they figure out and integrate this interesting algorithm that makes everything work together brilliantly, that's innovation. But innovation using one technology to say, well, now I have security system. I don't need uh, 25 guards. I need one guard and I have 60 cameras. Your capex is high. And yes, you do have cameras, but you know, in case of action, the only person that can actually do something is that one human being that you have and get there and do something physically. So thinking about things from a different point of view, how innovation, how innovation works is very important because there's a lot of wrong perception and the wrong ideas on what innovation is. It's definitely not technology. It's humans using their resources and technologies to bring something new to create something different. In the end, what is innovation? Is you do something, you get the same result, but you do it differently. You do it using different tools. And that definitely requires a human. So it's not here to take anyone's job. Innovation is actually required more people that think outside of the box with critical thinking and solution finding approach. Knowledge and technology, all of that can be definitely gained in the process. So that's my mindset and my opinion about innovation. So if anyone want to ha have any questions about innovation, specifically since we're discussing it and how it affects future solutions, please do let me know. I'd like to keep this like an open chat because I can talk forever. I do this a lot. So if anyone have any questions, please do let me know. Such a quiet crowd. <laughs> I have a question. Brilliant. The cost of innovation. Wallah, Inas or Inas, Inas Masmoudi. Cost of innovation depends. It depends on the project. For example, um, for Gaia, which is a food security per capsule, can be around 150,000 dirham. Um, in the market, some, something similar can be $250,000. So by manufacturing it in the UAE, identifying your supply chain, using your brain, your resources, your all the expertise that you can have, or making it in the UAE for a way better price with much better technology. Uh, definitely technology is coming from other places because we don't manufacture chips or technology here. So we definitely import things from abroad. This is something I think the UAE 100 billion um, a strategy for manufacturing should be resolving with time, inshallah. But yeah, cost of innovation depends on the project because I'm going to talk. We have another project that is 15 billion dirham. That's totally a different uh, costing for it when it comes to innovation. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. You answered the question. Actually, I'm thinking about the cost of innovation and how it will impact also your sales and your revenue. So uh, I know that it's a huge investment. Uh, did it scare you to go for it? Uh, because you maybe have some apprehension regarding the uh, the cost of the product and how to market this. Uh, my product or the product in the market? Your product in the market. So um, definitely when you're creating something new, you have resistance. People sometimes don't really believe in something that's new and different. They, um, resistance is always there. It's a matter of education, uh, promotion, messaging, and strategic positioning of what you're trying to do. So you're trying to change perception, especially when you're telling them, you're not, this tomato is not from the field, it's actually from a capsule. 
But let me show you a live feed and, and I, I will tell you that there was no chemicals or pesticides. The actual field had 70% more harmful substances in it. Changing people's perception is not easy. But um, if, if everyone have uh, taken that as a reason not to do something, I would, no one, we will not have uh, Tesla or this laptop I'm using now to talk to you guys or any of the technologies that we have today. So change comes with time. It's, um, it's all about timing as well, a bit of luck sprinkled in that. And it's business decisions that you're making when it comes to, for example, cost of innovation, your CapEx, your, your supply chain, how you're gonna get these technologies, how you're gonna put them together. You're insourcing, insourcing some like in-house, um, uh, some of the aspects or everything is outsourced. You know, you need to look into everything and study all the factors. Only by that you can manage the costing. How I, I manage my costing, our target is to make good quality food affordable. Looking into the agritech solutions and the, uh, and the, even the organic is just too expensive. And that's one of the things I really don't like and what we want to tackle. So what we're expecting from Gaia is to have almost the same price of what you see in the market, the one with chemicals and pesticides to start with, because we're trying to change perception, adding a bit more, but because we use a lot of technology integrated together, we are able to uh, fluctuate the prices. You don't have the same OPEX and we're using renewable energy because we're considering sustainability. In the beginning, we faced a lot of challenges because the capex for investing in solar, it was around 2.6 million. It was a bit expensive and we were looking into other options and uh, talking to our team because we're developing our own um, solutions for battery storage. We're looking into do doing it on our, our, on our own self, like taking it on us and doing the solar uh, park for the actual farm because it's just too expensive to buy it. Nevertheless, keep in mind, like you can actually recycle most of the these uh, uh, solar panels. It's just um, the industry is not mature enough. People is resisting renewable energy, which is affecting the supply chain, making it more expensive. And that's why it's 2.6 million. I was going to comment on that. I was thinking then, why is this is, of course, this is, I think, what you're, what you're doing, uh, Anud, is uh, agripreneurship. And uh, since it's there, why is the ecosystem not mapped out? If you have an, if there's an ecosystem, it will contribute directly to your costs and it will contribute directly to the whole project. It will even help you move forward in, in lightning steps, I guess. But I, what I'm feeling from what you're saying, Anud, is that you guys are really doing a lot. And as you said, um, uh, yani you're doing a lot yani, on your own shoulders. And this is this maybe is what's hindering the the, the, the jump forward. But it, but definitely, agripreneurship is now something that is out there, and everyone is discussing it seriously. Every country is taking it seriously. I was going to even ask you why are you not considering from the point with the crops? Why are we not considering corn? China has proved that corn is a source of energy. It, so we can eat it and we can use it for renewable energy as well. So I was thinking, why we why why innovation is what innovation is the recipe, the way things are done. It's not just plugging and playing, it's how things are done. So to see my supply chain, to see the people that are with me, to see what's available, to you know, to see the whole pipeline, we need the ecosystem to be mapped out. So what is the what is hindering this part here, Ba? Not why don't we why can't we see a, an ecosystem that's mapped out? Just for your information, I have a friend of mine who's really into the same uh, 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 passion where, where you are he has also he had uh, he developed his own platform okay he's an Egyptian engineer and he developed his platform he called it Zerai and it's an application also that monitors you know crops you know Egypt is, is, a, is majorly uh, the GDP is depending on agriculture of course and uh, he made he had recently featured it and he's pushing it forward and the country uh, the government seems to be embracing it or they will take it in but what they did was, and really helped everything to jump forward was they mapped the ecosystem. They mapped it out and they put it out there. And that's where the government gave them full support and all the other people that are involved in such, an, uh, in such a business were all there. And it cut down costs very quickly and it moved things quite fast. So what's hindering the ecosystem here? Why can't we map it? 
I will be very honest with you, Shayma. I will be very, very honest. Uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem is not um, mature. It's not mature. There is a lot of, um, uh, every country where you see proper entrepreneurship is when you have um, seed investment. Uh, you have proper investment. The company is sold, I'm, I'm the 100% owner because we had to do it ourselves from the beginning. Uh, you have someone that this says- is, This alone is a huge pressure. This alone is a huge pressure. It's like, where's your support system? And you're trying to provide a huge support system, which actually is not gonna just benefit for the country. You are talking about changing how things are done. You are writing a new page. That's too much on your shoulders. Sarahatan. There has to be another way. Our 10 years plan, it, it's not only doing it for the UAE, we're talking about the whole region. We're talking about how the region can have their own food security so they don't have to rely on independence on any country. So if there is a conflict between these two, we, we have still bread. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't need to, we don't need to rely on others. And R and D is very important because we don't have our own R and D from the region for the region. So Correct. that is another thing, that is another cost that we add on ourselves. Yeah. Because we need it. Because the only R and D that you will have is the big five telling you uh, what um, to do, how to do it, and what to yeah. With 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 what with Western knowledge, with with something that was working in the U S. Baba Habibi, you have different temperature in the U S. Your your humidity is different level. The region needs its own R and D. The region needs its own people to actually research what is the resources now. The Egypt, for example, there is amazing progress. Like I just mentioned, Sirka. The, the owner is Egyptian. They have amazing knowledge and they have amazing mindset. Knorr did a project in, uh, in Cairo. They've been farming on rooftops for families yes, who have correct. due to, to, to COVID, you know? And they Knorr, because Knorr had this um, a strategy on helping them as farmers, but they were making money out of it. So the idea is how everyone can win. Farmers farm on the rooftops, they give them the hydroponic systems and the seeds. They taught them how to do it. Next thing happening, boxes coming from the buildings, going to the retailers. That yeah, is this, this farming on the rooftops has been out there for even before COVID, but, but you're, you are right. Nor very managed to structureize it in such a way and they you know facilitated it so that it's, it's productive, not just personal efforts by people. So what is the difference between before and after? Knorr logo. You trusted the Knorr before that. Yeah, correct. You trusted the brand. Now you have the brand logo. Uh, um Hassan <laughs> doing that before. <laughs> now I know that what she have is better. Yeah. Because yeah, not logo. yeah. That is the mindset of the consumer. But there is a lot of um, aspects. But coming back to your very important question is, so you have the investment failing on the startups. Mm. So we're willing to invest and put a huge amount of budgets on bringing people from outside to work here and then mm. invest in them. And instead of investing from people from here and then they can um, go outside. Yeah. That is one thing. Number two, there is, a, uh, there is as a woman, we're hindered by the fact that we're women. And I'm, I'm not sexist. <laughs> I'm not sexist. I'm not, I'm, I'm a feminist for all of your daughters, moms, and, and, and kids and everyone. But what I'm saying is, as an Emirati woman, an mm. Emirati man have an easier approach to go to any majlis sit with a lot of men and tell his ideas and share it as women. And it seems to be acceptable easily. There's such a sense of trust. But when a woman says it, it comes it's out gonna, it's gonna be. with well, a question mark. Be. I'll tell you what about the UAE. There is something <laughs> very interesting in our demographics. 70%, you guys know it, 70% of people in higher education are women. Sah. You have most of the women who finish, they go to the jobs. Most of the men go to the army. There is women, they have actually, there is a lot of trust in women. The only thing that is missing when we're talking about women entrepreneurs is um, the channels to communicate their ideas and their challenges. Once I cannot sit in a majlis and talk to X and Y and Z investor, I will have to create my own path. I will have to create my own ecosystem. And that's what took time because there was no one before me to tell me that. I had to find my own mentor. I didn't find a place where they said, okay, there is a bunch of women entrepreneurs here, meet them. They will mentor you to help you thrive through your business. Today, I am mentoring 
other students who would like to have their own business. But I did not have someone. I had to create my own mentors. I had to stick to my friends, the entrepreneurs, and learn from their journey. But there was no place to go to as, as a woman. And, uh, and to find there is maybe few women entrepreneur, and, and I think there are women, uh, there is two only platforms or three platforms. Oh, oh, there are some platforms, but definitely they are not uh, catering to that kind of scale of project that you're working on. Yani, we are talking about the basic things, the simple things. You, you know, I see it, you know, even when you ask the, the girls, when, you, when I go to these places, when I listen to the projects, they're all the same. They're all basic, simple, very, I don't know, acceptable I things by them the side. Abaya but, projects. Shukran. And perfume. Abaya perfume, creams. Yeah, but yeah, you, you got it. You got the it. The potential for them to thrive in a sustainable approach to this, like for example, the giving movement. Great mm-hmm. Emirati business, sustainably making clothes made out of bamboo. Look at how, how they're thriving. The future mm-hmm. museum, all the staff wearing their clothes. Ah. There is potential, but to build it the right way, to have it properly, you need a bit of money to back you up, to have something that looks proper. When you're going to do it in different ma'ara, then you're going to stick in a kiosk and slowly, it's going to take you 10 years. Years. Years, wallah. This At way. Least. Yeah. So that's, that's the gap. I think it's the funding, number one. Number two is the, the ecosystem availability. Now, I, I was part of creating ecosystems, but it was very techy. It was not mm. business. It was fintech applications, websites. They're all trying to create the next Amazon, the next, but yeah. they were not trying to create the Bill Gates. No. They're trying to create the Amazons, the Souk, uh, the, these people, you know, the Kareem, mm. brilliant, but they were not trying to create the Bill Gates, where there is mm. actually something physical that is being developed. They're not made for that. Mm. They're made for creating platforms, subscription, pay me online, Apple Pay, but not an actual physical manufacturing supply chain. No, it's not made. The, the ecosystem is not made for that. Farming now... I found out recently in, 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 a, in, a, in a session I was sitting with Dr. Um, Sirim Al Hashmi and his Excellency Ibrahim Fouad from the UN. It was a beautiful mm-hmm. session. We all sat and we we're talking about it. The first time food security was discussed was 2014. Not very long. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, somewhere around there, 14 or I think it was even or maybe all before that, 2012 maybe. Yeah, it's it when, was, it's when beginning. China started declaring corn. It was it's when China started declaring corn as an alternative source of energy. That's when agripreneurship started jumping. But that's that's the thing, you know. Food is is just one aspect. But don't think about farming as farming. Packaging yeah. for food is a business industry. Supply chain is a, is a business industry. Having an application where you have all the suppliers with all their prices, so every uh, agri tech can find it's a business industry having solutions for these growing demands and the marketing for the water energy food nexus is an opportunity for entrepreneurs now and entrepreneurs are going to develop ideas they're going to come they're going to do a prototype and testing and find different platforms but if they don't actually have the funding to make it happen they're stuck here until someone comes from outside and do it or get investment from outside absolutely why don't we turn it around, okay? Why don't you, well, let's say, yani for Gaia, uh, or Gaia, as you call it, sorry, uh, why don't you, it's, it's an idea, why don't you map it out, the ecosystem, with all the missing, yani you can, yani you will show what is there, what is actually there, and you can show also what needs to be there, but is still missing. And that can be a map for, potential entrepreneurs we need somewhere someone that can do this kind of task figure it out you want this and that and this way maybe when you this way is another way of inviting new uh, people with new funding sources and with the entrepreneurial mindset it's not like you're opening it up for a company no you're opening it up for entrepreneur so why don't you do it the other way around after the whole map is there what's actually there halas it's there with the name of the vendor the supplier or whatever they are it's and like reverse psychology. And in Tikida, this way, you're mapping out the map for entrepreneurs. You're helping them come in. And then you will see real innovation. And people will come in and they will think over, oh, you're saying this is missing. Why don't we do it this way? Out of the box. Hmm. 
and this way you open the, the, the whole innovation entrepreneurial path to everyone, to yourself, command, maybe to let you see things from another angle. Plus, definitely investment. I'm meaning here money will come in from this one. From no, this I have one, a question. Do you know what is missing as well that we don't have? Mm. What? We don't have university funds. The, uni the university funds? Funds. So in, in the UK, in the Jama, every university have a fund. So every student have an idea. Part of the course, they're developing a business idea. Like, for example, the Graphene Institute, for example, I'm just throwing an idea, the Graphene Institute. Just check it out. This guy just got a three million investment on stand in an event. I was there by Mubadara. He came all the way from Manchester. Maki. But why this is not there? Because the 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 the, the, the culture in UK and the, and US, they are already involved in their own communities and they are getting the ideas of what is needed for research from the community. So they are actually working on actual solutions to companies. The research that's performed by the research center in any university is actually being funded by the company that's asking for the answers. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it works. Ihna, 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 we're still here very immature in that. Ihna, yalla, yalla, we're talking about making some papers, and, but as a research center, no, we don't have here. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, 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 how it works. You have companies doing it, but you have the government doing it as well. And you have the university yeah. having donors doing it. So there are three different ways of doing that. And I'm going to give you an example because I've worked with them and I, and I know how it works. And, and the way it worked is that they identified a problem, they developed a solution, and they, mm -hmm. then they sold one of the solutions. All the IPs are being paid by the university uh, mm -hmm. through the funders, the government, or the investment. So if a company comes and I go, uh, Samsung, um, Ericsson, whatever, the company comes and says, look, I'm going to give you guys 1 million a year. Mm -hmm. And I have these problems in my business model. And I want the students. It's part of the curriculum becomes that developing the solution. Once they develop the solution, share it back with the company. The company work with them together. They create the prototype, test it. It works brilliantly. These students will have a small company that gets bought by the big company. So these students, their entrepreneurship journey just started. Now they have the money to start their next idea. If that company want to buy it totally 100%. Or it says you continue running it, you're a plug and play concept. Which happened with so many companies where they kept these startups and they became almost like a department within the organization. There are so many, so many ways of doing it. Keeping in mind that there are some strategies and policies. And for example, in UK, because I'm, I'm going to share something I know about. If you're buying technology from them, like from UK, they have a fund for you because your business is relying on technology from their country. So there are so many factors that plays into that, but university have a huge role. I'll tell you why. These hungry brains, the young ones, they don't see the problems that we see in business. So it is more, even more agile and, and faster and in, in, in finding solutions than we are because we, we once you see so many problems in a business and you work on it, so you're expecting it. Yeah, you are expecting that, okay, I'm going to have this problem. But when you have this student who's learning things, they see things from a different angle and they find solutions from a different angle that can actually play a huge role. So we're missing out on these young people because once they finish university, they either go to a job that has nothing to do with what they studied or they get married and stay at home or something like that. But when we give them something they believe in that they're capable of doing from university stage, from that stage, last two or three years, it is something that's going to change the demographics of business and startups. That is the missing, one of the missing things. So we have funding, we have funds in universities and research center in universities. So actually we do research for us. Yeah, and why uh, PwC, well, uh, why uh, Ernest & Young, why, why they don't pay money to say these are students going to do our R&D? There's so many, we can complain about everyone. Not but you know, I, 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 I love the reverse psychology. We do have the, uh, uh, from farm to fork, we do have the whole journey. Or for, for yours, is going to be like fork to farm. <laughs> the opposite, the reverse psychology. And we know what is missing. And we are working with the government. Honestly speaking, we the government always had open arms to our complaints. They are the best. <laughs> we call them, we complain to them. This is not working. Why this is not there? And they're very supportive. The biggest challenge we faced was COVID. The biggest. It's the supply chain um, interruption. Logistically, it was uh, okay. everyone, not only us, Saraha. Okay. 
Let's see if there is. Tamhini Anud, I took so much of your time. Oh, I love it. I love yeah. this conversation. I think it's Thank brilliant. You. With, with major weather change, how technology prepared to respond? So major weather changes you have. So from my knowledge and from our R&D, uh, increase in temper the temperature is, uh, I don't want to say my point of view because it's scary, but uh, I hope it reduces very soon. Um, we're going to keep having um, problems with the temperature increase. I'm talking about places like Ireland struggling, by the way. And Ireland have like food uh, sufficiency and endemic they are very well off when it comes to producing their own uh, food. And they don't have all the vegetables and fruits, but they have the basics. They don't need, if anything happens, Ireland can survive. They have their potatoes, their carrots there. They, they have their basic and their meat, so they don't need uh, from anyone else. Um, the rest is just wants, it's not needs. We need to differentiate. Now, how does the weather affect it? There's so many aspects. So there's the temperature aspect. There is temperature, it's all in, in connection. So temperature will affect the water level. Water level is, is definitely, I've seen recently we're working on something and I saw the, the map in the next 15 years, half of New York will not be there. Venice, guys, if you wanna to go to Venice, go now because Venice will not be there. Um, the, the water level is gonna be um, scary uh, increasing. And um, when we talk about that is, is finding this, and I was discussing this recently uh, with um, an interesting conversations between Iraq and Turkey. And both of them have an interesting geopolitical water resources uh, story. Turkey have been holding off the water from Iraq. Iraq is now importing 70% of its food and vegetables. And uh, Iraq is an agricultural heaven. Uh, so this is just uh, like uh, the tip of an iceberg of what can happen in the future. Why I'm mentioning this, because we had a discussion on water level. Desalination is actually a solution to increasing water level. Never, nevertheless, losing uh, the, the ice losing the ice surfaces is a problem because we're losing marine life. We're using um, a, a biodiversity is the, one of the most crucial impacts when it comes to weather. Because every little creature in the sea and in the soil is playing a role in how we are eating our food today. The bee is responsible for most of our food. And bees are a resource now. Bees are a resource. They're being stolen from farms. Their cost can reach up to two hundred thousand dollars as a hive, and if a, a village, not one hive, a village of bees in a farm can be stolen. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. All of that is leading us to understand and need to appreciate and leave conflict aside because the next challenge is so big. The next challenge is weapons will not play anything in it but losing lives. It cannot plant a tree. It cannot give you water. So the, that mindset of the cost of uh, 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 how the weather is gonna change, uh, it's gonna be expensive to do the changes that we need to do. Bio biodiversity is playing um, global warming, uh, uh, climate change is definitely there. We, we saw it, you feel it, you feel it. Everyone felt it, you can feel it. Uh, winter after winter, summer after summer, you can feel it in, in the air, you can see that there's a change happening. How much food security has the achieved so far in terms of self-reliance? Uh, COVID was an eye opener, it was a wake up call. Um, manufacturing is definitely, we have basic, basic stuff. We're still an importer of 80% of our food and uh, fruits and vegetables, fresh produce. Uh, interesting enough, the top thing that we import is animal feed. <laughs> It's not for humans, it's for the goats and the cows and the horses. So that is an industry in itself. That's an opportunity if someone want to explore. Animal feed is one of the major um, uh, food uh, chain or the, in the supply chain that we are importing to the UAE. So we have a long way, but we know what's interesting that we have the technology. So we have the technology, we have the brains. Uh, I, we like, I like the diversity of the people that we have here that can come together and develop solutions. I don't think anything is impossible. We have all the brains and all the technology to create these solutions. Um, like we said, to me, is the supply chain missing? Um, like, for example, in the wholesale industry, there is some kind of um, monopolies, duopolies kind of things. 
Um, but you have the government who have the strategies, they're willing to hear people. Uh, there is investors out there willing to invest. Um, to me, it's um, a lot of people ask me why I haven't taken any investment yet because my strategy needs to align with my investor strategy. I cannot have an investor who want to go to the left and I want to go to the right. Uh, we need to have a synergy in the way that we would like to manage, especially I have a 10 year strategy for the business and it's uh, it already started. So changing something uh, because um, of um, being very honest agendas, um, it's, it's, it's not something I'm interested in. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think we do have 10 minutes. Yes, we still have time. Anyone, any question, feel free. You guys used to tell us there's no stupid questions. So I'm gonna say there's no stupid questions. Every question count. <laughs> so please, anything. Um, or even comments, because I'm learning a lot as well from all of you. I have a question or not. You mentioned uh, support for entrepreneurs. What support did you get for your project? Because your project is very innovative, very expensive, as you mentioned. What support mechanisms you had? Either you, you go big or you go home. <laughs> That's the kind of projects. <laughs> um, so Dubai SME is one of our major uh, supporters. They helped us with subsidizing. Um, I'll answer that. Um, so the, they have us with subsidizing a lot of the cost. And um, uh, cost is important when you are a startup. It's very important. Everything that you can save cost in, it's very important. Uh, also, they have a support system. So for example, dealing with the retailers or reaching out to certain entities, they, was, they were very helpful. So that is, Dubai SME was very supportive. I have support from Young Arab Leaders. Young Arab, I call them the Young Arab uh, Leaders family. They're our family. We're very interconnected when it comes to meeting and, and, and uh, we have a lot of sessions where we sit and learn from great people. You know, there's inspiration. When you're an entrepreneur, you, you, you're hungry for inspiration. Your conversations is either business or something that you want to learn from. So you know, the Young Arab Leaders family always have uh, supported us, um, supported by, uh, I can't really mention some of, some. I, I wish I can mention some of the projects more in details that we're working on, but because of certain agreements and um, NDA signed, I can't really share. Uh, but I can share that, you know, there is one of the royal families who have been supporting us from Abu Dhabi, where we have a land between Dubai and Abu Dhabi that is allocated for our first Gaia farm, where we're going to have 50 capsules that's going to be producing 500 metric tons annually. So um, um, there is definitely support that you can receive. And other than the support of family and friends, which I think is very crucial and important. So your family support and uh, um, um, being being. Oh, how would I say it? Having the right partner as well, uh, getting the right support from a partner. Um, I'm single, but you know, uh, you know, having the the people around you, the family, that is very important. Um, it plays a huge role. Having the wrong partner is like having the wrong business. You need someone that supports your ideas and support what you're trying to achieve because you're going to be working 24/7, endlessly every day on the weekend. So you need to be managing things. Um, that's entrepreneurship to you guys. Uh, I'm happy to answer my question. There is a question from Ar Sabr. Can you elaborate, please? Ar Sabr, join us. Mr. Hussam, I think, is it? No. And this is Dr. Rashid Sabr. Dr. Rashid Sabr, please. Yes, hi. Uh, you know, thank you for the information provided. Really, it's very interesting. Now, as we know, Monsanto is the major agriculture company doing a good research. Do you have any association with them or with no, another don't. company like Conagra? Conagra is really a great, a great company dealing, uh, also do research on agriculture products. Do you have any association with them? Learn from their experience? No, we don't. Um, I think because we do have our own R&D, uh, we have we have dealt uh, with partners who shared with us their R and D, who wanted to get uh, um, information or be part of our supply chain. Yani, um, to explain it better, so we had entities reaching out to us, and this is this is something that entrepreneurs face. By the way, I'm I'm going to be very honest. When you're so much into the project, 
you literally too busy to look into other things. So you, I have the team who bring for me the, the reports, who create it and develop and work on the R&D. So they will look into these uh, entities, they will get the information, but they, I will, in the end, I will see our version of our R&D developed and built on our business model. Uh, but I can definitely ask for you. I would, I would love to check them. Can I take a screenshot? Is that okay? Smile, everyone, if, if your camera is on. <laughs> I just took a screenshot, so I have that in the chat as well, and everyone's beautiful face. I would like to know how you tested your business idea in the beginning. Good question, Saheed. Um, Dr. Saheed, what, what we did. So we got these two small fridges, the coolers, and we created that controlled climate environment inside, which had uh, at that time six different technologies. So we were controlling the temperature, humidity, air purification, water purification, lighting system, and the nutrition system and the water pipings um, and battery. Uh, and we put them in two different locations below zero and above 45. I have a picture I'll share it with you so you guys can see what I'm talking about. That's it. And um, that's what allowed us to understand the potential of what we're working on. Honestly speaking, when you're too much into the details, and that's the problem with every entrepreneur, that was when you don't really see. Um... Let me know if everyone is, can see the, the slides. I think it's buffering now. We can see it. I'm waiting, I can't see it. <laughs> you can see the slides? It has the futures company? Yes. Okay. Let me know if, it, if I, I can, okay, now I can see it as well. It's perfectly. Okay. Still loading for me. My laptop is um, not very happy with my usage of its resources. Okay, I think now it should be working. So this is the document investment pitch deck, our story and how it all started, which most probably I told you already. So our inspiration, uh, I, I always was known for having a lot of imagination, like since childhood. So when I read the, and I heard about His Highness uh, quote, I was like, oh my God, this feels like it's for me. The future belongs to those who can imagine it, design it and execute it. So definitely imagination is important. Um, so this is some of the information. I think this is interesting. So uh, international problems that we have with the imports, UAE imports 80%, but even places with a lot of agri-tech resources are importing as well, food due to climate and stuff like politics you know, and um, things that hinders their progress. Um, one of the problems as well, uh, Shema uh, Stathati, I wanna mention something, is um, one of the problems that we have regionally, I'm not talking about the UAE, but in the region, is having people not qualified in, in positions that need people who are qualified, in positions that need to understand the sector or an industry. Uh, that's, I'm not talking about, I'm talking in the region. Uh, you will have someone who have no knowledge about this industry at all, who was moved from another ministry to this ministry because they want to get rid of him from that ministry. He's in this ministry, so he's going to do his work for a couple of years. That problem that we have in this region is one of the main obstacles that our ecosystem is not developing. I think we figured it out here earlier and we managed to kind of uh, change it. Technology. Um, Understanding the SDGs and the different aspects and the KPIs of the SDGs. A lot of people think the SDGs is putting plastic in the plastic box and glass in the glass box. SDGs are very, very uh, different. The Gaia actually takes 13 out of the 17 SDGs. Climate, we talked about it. Um, Sheikh Zaid, we talked about how he talked about granting agriculture is actually granting civilization. Uh, mentioned, uh, anyone want me to stop here, please just. Um, so you, just one thing, if you are moving something, the slides are not moving for us. Really? Yes. Okay, let me know now. I was moving one. Yeah, for us, we just see the futurist company making ideas work. That's all. Doing it again now. Let me know. When you... I'll take it to the next slide, so actually see. Yeah, now we can see. 
brilliant. So what I was saying is um, the Sheikh Hamad and like imagination is always inspiring me with his quote about, uh, you know, belongs to those who have imagination. Because when you imagine, you can design and execute. And this is why I even have another role in a company called Big Bad Wolf. And it's all about reading. And because I believe reading have a huge impact on Im imagination. The more you read, the more you have imagination, the more, the more you have ambition. Uh, before that, I was just saying that I shared most of this information already. We talked about the importing of food and the cost and increase uh, of expenses and cost and technology and climate and how Sheikh Zayed believed in agriculture. Our story, how we use the NASA research and the Space Center research to develop something that doesn't exist. Uh, the elevator pitch, we used AI, we're trying to reduce cost. We're using a sustainable renewable energy um, solution that help us to provide food, but making it affordable for everyone instead of increasing the, temper the, the, the pricing because of the different aspects, whether it's temperature, climate, etc. There is so much opportunity in the industry. Uh, so we were talking about Gaia. So what Gaia, and, and so here is the innovation part. When we had all these technology put together to create this innovation, which is human made because human brain decided to put these, us, we decided this is how it works. We have higher output and yield, lower comparative capex, lower utilities cost, automated low labor cost, and prediction, very accurate prediction. We know exactly when the harvest will be because of the AI system. So all of that is the innovation impact to Gaia. Uh, this is some of our team information. Um, and I'll speak about Gaia automated AI farming system. So we talked about the automation aspect. So it, it, it literally learns from its experience and manages everything inside the capsule, which allow us not to need to have 18 labors uh, for our uh, 500 metric ton annually. We will have uh, six instead. Artificial intelligence is very important, plays a crucial role because it gives you data. Data helps you um, not only a source of money. Data is very important because it is your R&D that you're going to develop on. Farming, everyone knows farming. We're using synthetic biomass, so we don't use soil. So there's no insects, no chemicals or pesticides required at all. The rest is different systems that we're using as well for the farming. And these are the different technologies that we have. So our biometers, data transmission, visual monitoring. You have a live feed of what's happening inside the capsule. Um, our Gaia is made in the UAE. We're structuring them. We have the ISO for uh, an actual container. So they can be logistically transportable and we can take them to different locations. We're planning to donate the capsule for every 50 capsule we build to a location where we train a village or we train the, the location so they can produce their own food and sell it. Um, this is an important now. Let's talk about innovation. Um, I, I, must, I, I missed this point. Uh, in, in traditional farming, if today I'm growing tomato and tomorrow I want to grow bell pepper, do you guys know what is the steps required? And how long it takes? By any chance. By any chance, if someone knows. It will take around at least at least three months to remove old crop, change soil. Three months, four months. Great, great answer. It will take a long time. Now, from a food security point of view, that's three months you don't have certain kind of crop. Let's say in Gaia, if the government comes and says tomorrow we need tomato instead of lettuce, next day we can start the germination process. You can buy germination ready. Uh, something like lettuce will require less than 45 days to harvest. Something like tomato will require less than 90 days to harvest. And when you have a solution that creates its own climate, you don't have seasons. You keep growing, you keep harvesting. It's the same quality every time. So there is this agility and adaptability and fast turnaround for crisis in case you need to change the type of crop. Scalability is another aspect. You can have as much as you want of these capsules. And multiple verticals is something very interesting because we can work with the government, we can work with the farmers, we can work with the retailers, we can work with the restaurants. Tomorrow you'll have your home edition. So there's so many verticals. And I don't like the word disruptive, but it has some disruptive technology integration. And I think we came to almost the end of this. 
Okay, so this is, we were talking about the prototype. There was a question. I'll go back to the prototype. Okay, so Mr. Dr. Sahid, this is our prototype. Yes, ma'am. You can see the, the prototype here. Sorry. Thank you. So the one on the left is the actual crop that we had. And it was the same in both below zero and above 45 compared to the standard hydroponics on the right. So the one on the left is our product and it was 30% better yield. This is the actual Gaia. And you can see we have lettuce, we have tomato, we have bell pepper, we have dill. You have the variety of options. This is our commercial prototype. My dream is to have uh, an agri-tech city in the future where you come and harvest your own fruits and vegetables and children connect again with Mother Earth using technology this time. Um, this is all just information on the different growth plans. And these are now financial stuff that I should not be sharing. <laughs> But I wanna say thank you all. I'm just gonna go through some of the, I'll leave this slide on. And I wanna go through some of the chat if you allow me. Uh, mentorship. So mentorship, I'm doing different mentorship. I'm doing now with Bentley, the car, <laughs> the car company Bentley is working with us. They selected few uh, uh, Emirati women to actually mentor students. Um, so I do mentor, it just depends. Sometimes it can be really hectic. So. It need to be um, it need to be managed properly so we can actually they can learn as much the, the, like the most out of the journey instead of sitting there just listening to me talk or showing them or they're watching me. So I like to engage them. So timing is important as well depending on the project. Thank you. I'm glad you can feel my energy and enthusiasm. I would love to transfer this energy to your students. We need more women, we need more men, we need more youth that is playing a role in business and developing solutions. Because we in the Middle East used to have and lead so many sectors in math and medicine, and I believe we can do it again. Problems, gaps faced, so we can propose these to our students. So, uh, uh, Dr. Haya, I would say, um, Supply chain, um, recycle, but think of it from um, packaging, sustainable packaging, um, uh, as well as uh, building um, ecosystems. That's, that's a beautiful uh, example was given already by Shema. The ecosystem, if they go through that ecosystem, they'll find the gaps. That can be an exercise on its own, creating the business um, canvas and then identifying their uh, business models. That would be very interesting to see what they can come up with. Um, but for Agritech, definitely imagine having a supply chain portal with all the restaurants and the restaurants can go and buy their Agritech solutions. You know what I mean? Smart solution. And you have one of the things, I keep forgetting this, is very important. So the AI system that we have in Gaia, not only it manages things, it actually calculates the carbon footprint per product, the lettuce, carbon footprint, the tomato, carbon footprint, because we want to use that to educate people in the packaging. So imagine we have a packaging partner who creates, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now to an Emirati who's doing packaging from leftovers of palm trees. You know, they remove things from the palm trees and whatever is the, 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 yeah. the waste, they're actually creating a sustainable, reusable packaging from it. I think also the machines change, correct? Even the materials of the machines, they should be more uh, friendly. I mean, in terms of sustainability, you should I don't know if you, you can always look to the ESG aspect. So the environmental, social and governance aspect and everything that you do within any business model. Now, from a supplier point of view, as an entrepreneur, you will look for the most effective, like quality wise and the most efficient financially because you're an entrepreneur, you're a startup. Once you become the big company that have a lot of money. Now that becomes mandatory that you look for the most environmental. If the most environmental option is the cheapest, I'll tell you, I will definitely take it. But in most cases, the most environmental is not the cheapest because they are yeah, facing absolutely. supply chain problems. No one is believing in them. They want to go to the cheapest plastic instead of this reusable or environmental. And that's what causes another dilemma and another problem as well. For example, I'll give you an example, which is um, we were talking about it recently. 
uh, how um, certain items, the prices will be very high, whether it's organic food, whether it's by, buying certain material, because it's environmental, like, you know, these uh, plant-based meat. It's eating red meat is the most harmful thing, but it doesn't mean if we stop eating red meat, they're going to stop killing the cows. You know what I mean? They'll find another way to make money out of it, well, even if they sell it to the dogs. But the idea is when we have plant-based option, it's still the most expensive option. It's more expensive than the normal meat because the supply chain and the demand is not mature enough for them to reduce their prices yet. Same thing was with electric vehicles. They were very expensive. Prices started reducing now because the supply chain has developed and matured. So this is what, is hap what happens in every new industry. It's the maturity of the supply chain that allows the prices to come down, whether it's the availability of pieces and parts, whether it's the availability of certain engine oil that is only required for this, well, you don't have an engine oil because it's a battery, but you know what I mean. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any question. Education has an impact on your success as an entrepreneur, oh, 100%. Firstly, education is the reason that will change our life. When they know that they have no future in 25 years because they're still believing that uh, a car, uh, like a fuel combustion uh, car is a cool car. You know, this is when we change the perception and they know that it's for them. What we're trying to do is not for us. We still live in this uh, COVID and crazy stuff happening and we have to go prices up, prices down. We want them to have better stability than what we did. And we know that it's going to be very difficult if changes doesn't happen now. Only now we can do it. Because literally in 15, 20 years, there is no U-turn. There's changes need to be done. But then even changes. We already have the boundaries. Breaking boundaries is an amazing documentary with David Attenborough talking about humans breaking the boundaries. And we have broken so many already. Thank you, Abdel Ghaffar. I think I answered all the questions and I had a brilliant time and I learned a lot. It was an interesting conversation. Of course, I will share my email and my LinkedIn is with my Kashmir and my social media is Future Alumni. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be speaking to HCT again and uh, bring so much memory I should find I should visit the campus uh, and uh, they're brilliant memories and I look forward uh, to anything I can support with if there's any ideas please feel free send them across thank you for such a great conversation I learned and uh, some ideas now I have them in my head and uh, we'll we'll be cooking them for a while I kind of like to cook things in my head and uh, and then look into how we can be implementing it Vaselina thank you so much for everything she was super patient with me Thank you, Eleanor. It was a great session and we learned a lot from you. We'll be in touch uh, for some future initiatives that you also gave us ideas for. And thanks to our partner, Young Arab Leaders as well. Thanks to them, we had uh, Alanut with us. Thank you very much, Alanut. And uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Have a lovely week ahead. What's left of it. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you.